wolves are apex predators who primarily eat elk and bison, but every so often a wolf develops a taste for human flesh. And in the case of a small town in Finland, it was a taste the wolf couldn't get enough of. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. This is the attack of the bloodthirsty wolf of Turu, attacking and eating 22 children in a single year. Welcome to Final Affliction. Wolves are riddled in legends throughout history. The predator's powerful nature, piercing looks, and spine-tingling howls continue to inspire both adoration and fear around the world. There's two major species of wolves. One species is the Ethiopian wolf that inhabit the mountains of Ethiopia. But the bloodthirsty wolf in today's story belongs to the species called the Grey Wolf. The smaller Ethiopian wolf stands at an average of about 26 inches tall and weighs less than 45 pounds. But the much larger gray wolf stands up to 36 inches tall at the shoulder and can weigh up to 175 pounds, making them the largest wild members of the dog family. But unlike regular dogs, the biting capacity of a wolf is 1,500 pounds per square inch. In comparison, a German Shepherd has a biting pressure of 750 pounds per square inch, only half the amount as a wolf. The strength of a wolf's jaw make it possible to bite through a moose femur in about six bites. Wolves are also very social creatures and operate as a group or a pack and often are comprised of six to ten wolves. There have only been 12 attacks with 14 victims of which two, across a period of 18 years, were fatal. But in the late 1800s, there was an attack so brutal it led to the complete culling and extinction of the wolves in the area. An attack by a bloodthirsty rogue wolf in Finland who attacked and ate 22 children within a single year. Turku is a small town in Finland that consists of flat forested plains covered by pine and fir trees. The wildlife in the area include brown bear, elk, moose, wolverine, reindeer, and wolves. The economy was based on agriculture and farming, which means most people raise their own food on family farms. In the nation of Finland between the year 1710 and 1881, there were up to 265 people killed by wolves, which is thought to be caused by human settlers drastically hunting the elk and moose, which is the wolves' primary source of food, leading them to hunt and prey outside its normal food source, attacking and eating humans. In the 1820s, Finland was beginning to experience a plague of lone wolf attacks, specifically on children. The wolves of Finland were quickly learning to hunt vulnerable humans such as children for easy food in times of scarcity. By the year 1880, the number of attacks and deaths caused by wolves were reaching alarming rates, and the attacks were all centered around the woods north of a town called Torku. When humans first settled there, the wolves were scared of humans, but now the humans were scared of the wolves. The first incident involved two young brothers who were enjoying themselves in the sauna on January 15th of 1880. From their family farm, the brothers witnessed a lone wolf emerge from the woods nearby and crossed their potato field. The wolf then hopped the fence and attacked the youngest of the two, eight-year-old Kali. It bit down on him and shook him like a chew toy before dragging him off into the woods as his brother ran to get his parents. The boy's mother summoned a rescue party and they followed the blood trail left in the snow. About 500 meters down the blood trail, the rescue party finds Kali's right leg, torn from his body just below the hip. As the rescue party traveled further down the blood trail expecting to find the boy's body, instead they discovered the boy's clothes, torn and bloody, but no body was ever found. It was clear that the boy was eaten by the wolf. After this deadly attack on 8-year-old Kali, the government put out bounties for wolves and organized wolf hunts in the surrounding areas, but none of it was successful and the wolves escaped all efforts to capture or kill them. About three months later, on April 23rd, two-and-a-half-year-old Johanna Week was playing in the yard. Her mother, who was inside the house, hears her daughter start to yell out in pain. Just outside the front door where her daughter had just been playing, she finds Johanna's severed foot. 
Her daughter and everything else were missing from the yard. Only a blood trail near the edge of her yard were found along with wolf tracks leading into the woods. Johanna's body was never found again, and her family held a memorial for her two days later. On the day of Johanna's memorial service on April 25th, three siblings were walking home from school. The oldest of the three sisters picked her five-year-old sister up and began to run with her, leaving her seven-year-old sister alone and lagging behind. They were very close to their home and just as they were about to get to safety, the wolf snatches seven-year-old Maria Matilda in its jaws and runs towards the nearby woods. The adults are soon alerted and they begin searching the area for Maria, but only her shoe and skirt were ever found. There's now been three children attacked killed and eaten in a span of just three months, all from what appears to be the same bloodthirsty lone wolf. Fear has now spread to the entire region. The very next day and a few miles down the road, two-and-a-half-year-old Maria Helen goes outside to fill a water bucket from a spring near her home. After some time passes without her daughter returning, her parents go searching for her, and to their horror, they find the water bucket laying empty in a pool of blood. The neighbors search for the little girl, but just like the other victims, no trace of her is ever found. Residents of the area immediately suspect the rampaging lone wolf. Thankfully, for the next three weeks, there were no reported wolf fatalities, but on May 25th, things take a turn for the worse. The Ladfala kids were playing in the front yard of their family cabin. The three-year-old daughter named Amanda doesn't notice what the other kids describe as a big dog approaching. The wolf bites the little girl by the neck and shakes her until she is dead. The other children run to get their mother and tell her that a big dog took Amanda. A search party gathers and after combing through the forest nearby, the only thing they find are the little girl's intestines near her shoes, with her feet still inside. The regional government begins calling for the complete culling and extinction of all wolves in the area, urging citizens to kill any wolf on sight and even offering bounties for every kill. This leads to six wolf pups being killed by hunters, but unfortunately, the murderous child-killing wolf is still on the loose. Nearly 11 weeks later on August 3rd, the rogue wolf set its eyes on its next victim. Two girls were walking up a remote dirt road on their family's farm situated beside the woods when a wolf appeared from nowhere. Ten-year-old Anna Linderberg is savagely attacked and killed by the wolf as Anna's friends stood frozen in fear. Finally coming to after realizing Anna was dead, she runs down the dirt path as the wolf begins eating Anna behind her and escapes. Events were quiet for nearly two months until October 6, when the wolf yet again gets a craving for his new favorite food, humans. The wolf attacks four-year-old Ida Tolmanen and carries her body deep into the woods where her father would later discover her remains. The next day, on October 7th, five-and-a-half-year-old Serafia Grandforce was snatched from the woods near her home. A search party combed the woods for the next two days, but tragically, her body or any signs of it were never found. At this point, the wolf has grown accustomed to the taste of human flesh. The children's inability to put up much of a fight only encourages the wolf to keep hunting them. A week later, on October 15th, five-and-a-half-year-old Pally Grunras is playing in the forest a short distance from his house he shares with his widowed mother. After returning back to his house for dinner, a large wolf appears and begins chasing him. The boy runs towards a strip of land that crosses a lake before the wolf pounces on him, quickly overtaking him and killing him with a bite to the neck. It drags him into the woods and eats his entire body except his foot and head, which are later found by his mother and the search party. About a week later, on October 22nd, nine-year-old Ida Laxo is leading a group of her classmates down the road as they walk home from school. A wolf suddenly appears and jumps over the surrounding fence by the tree line as it rapidly approaches the group of schoolchildren. It immediately focuses on Ida, biting her and dragging her into a snowbank. It attempts to grab her by the neck and shake her to death the way it had previously done to other children, but Ida is wearing a very thick scarf 
scarf that the wolf struggles to wrap his jaws around. Ida later reported that the wolf would press its ear to her chest during the attack as if it was checking to see if she was still breathing. Apparently, if she moved or breathed, the wolf would start attacking her again. After a few times this happened, she decided to play dead, causing the wolf to try to drag her into the forest thinking she was dead. Ida's thick winter clothing and scarf made it incredibly hard for the wolf to grab hold of her, continually dropping her while attempting to drag her to the forest. A man named Yanni Makila scares the wolf away by yelling at it. The wolf is distracted and now outnumbered by the growing amount of villagers rushing to the scene, deciding to run back into the woods and abandon its prey. When Ida tries to stand up, she collapses to the ground due to the wolf breaking her leg during the attack. Yanni carries her back to her mother and she went on to live another 80 long years, carrying with her the scars on her face and legs as a constant reminder of what could have easily been another fatal wolf attack. The local government in Turchu decided to set bait traps laced with poison throughout the woods to kill the wolves. The attacks were becoming such a problem they even handed out rifles to anyone willing to hunt the murderous wolves. Just six days after the incident with Ida, on October 28th, nine-year-old Yuko Leiko is attacked but luckily isn't killed during the attack. He survives, describing the horrifying attack to the villagers, increasing the fear throughout the region. Thankfully, there were no more fatalities or attacks caused by the wolves for the rest of the year. There had been nine fatal wolf attacks on children in six months so far, but the next two months without any attack was just the calm before the storm. Professional hunters pursue the wolves all winter long but are outsmarted and unsuccessful. After months of hunting the wolves, they failed to kill any of them, but miraculously, it seemed they've been scared away. No attacks or sightings of the wolf was reported for months. But just as the villagers' fears were starting to fade, in the spring of May 14, 1881, six-year-old Yohani was helping with chores by chopping some wood near his family home. When his mother glances out the window to see a wolf attacking him, she immediately runs outside to her son, but by the time she arrives, the wolf had carried his lifeless body into the woods and out of sight. Neighbors immediately formed a rescue party and tracked the wolf several miles. Yohani's pants were later found during the search, completely torn up and bloody. Around three weeks later on June 10th, nine-year-old Maritas was told to get his horse from the meadow near the forest. A lone wolf attacks the boy and quickly kills him. Two men who were in the area heard Maritas' screams and rushed over to scare the wolf off. Unfortunately, it was too late, and after recovering the boy's body, they took it back to his family, who were devastated. Almost three weeks after the last attack, on June 29th, five-year-old Gustav Victor is enjoying the sauna with his dad after a hard day's work around the house chopping wood and tending to the animals. Gustav, who was only five years old, couldn't handle the heat as long as his father, so he stepped out of the sauna to cool off a bit. Their house was only 75 feet away from the sauna, so he decided to walk back by himself. Gustav never made it the short distance back home. His body was discovered hidden in a swamp for later consumption. Due to the close concentration of the attacks, villagers believe the wolves must have pups nearby to feed. Either that or the wolves had begun to kill for the fun of it, which isn't very likely. Only a few weeks later on July 15th, seven-year-old Johan was out in a field near his uncle's farm in the broad daylight of 6 p.m. His parents watched a wolf quickly run up on their son and attack him, then run back into the woods while gripping their son in his mouth. They quickly chase after the wolf and their son, whose screams could be heard echoing throughout the forest. Tragically, seven hours later, they find his foot still inside of his shoe laying on the forest floor. A search party later finds the rest of his body stashed away in a nearby swamp, just like the victims before him. A little over a week later, on July 22nd, eight-year-old Gustav Hardman heads out berry picking with his little brother. Right in front of his brother, a lone wolf appears and immediately attacks and kills him. The lone wolf then drags his body away and stashes it in the swamp just like the two before him. Thankfully, his little brother is not injured and runs home to relay the tragic news to his parents. Only 10 days later, on July 31st, 
22-year-old Conrad Adderman was laying in his yard. His older sisters and brothers were watching him from the window when they witnessed a wolf coming towards their house from the road. The wolf hops the fence with ease and grabs Conrad in his jaws before jumping back over the fence with the young boy and disappearing into the woods. Just four days later on August 3rd, 8-year-old Matilda Savin is leading her family's herd of cattle with her 10-year-old sister. As they lead the cattle through a trail in the forest, a wolf suddenly leaps onto Matilda's back, grabbing the back of her neck by its teeth, killing her before carrying her body off to partially consume. Her father finds her remains about two weeks later. On August 15th, four-year-old Gustav Nimlin is being watched by his mother as he plays in the yard. She witnesses a wolf approaching, but before she could even react, the wolf attacked and killed her son before leaving with his body. She desperately runs after the wolf, who is now sprinting towards the tree line in the distance, but it's too late. The wolf drastically outpaces her, and within 30 seconds, the wolf, along with her son, are gone. A little over a mile away after a two-day search, rescuers find little Gustav's body stashed by the wolf for later consumption, again beside a swamp in the woods. Almost a month later on September 10th, seven-year-old Carl Forstrom is herding the family cattle as he sees a wolf approaching. Thinking fast, he tries to intimidate the wolf by climbing on a large rock and waving his arms and yelling as loud as he can. Without hesitation, the wolf approaches the boy and kills him. It then runs off with his body, which is later found mangled near the edge of the woods, half eaten by the wolf. Around three weeks later, on October 1st, eight-year-old Carl Cantella defied his parents' orders to stay in his house while they were at work. He had gotten thirsty while waiting for his parents to come home, so he decided to walk to the well for some drinking water located about 180 feet behind his house. After returning from work, his parents began calling his name after Carl was nowhere to be seen. They eventually stumble upon the horrifying sight of blood splatters around the well and later find his bloody clothes and some of his bones in the woods nearby. On October 6, government officials gathered to establish a committee to look into the wolf attacks and put an end to them forever. Nearly an entire month passes with no reported attacks, until on Halloween night, six-year-old Christina Johansson is returning home just after sunset. Her mother watches her approach the yard and enter the gate. Christina opens the door to the house and just as she takes one step inside, she is attacked from behind by a wolf. It knocks her to the ground and drags her back outside the house and into the woods. Her mother chased the wolf until reaching the tree line where there were two pups waiting there. Her mother watched in horror as they consumed much of Christina's body. Just one week later, on November 7, five-year-old Carl Grunruss was playing with his friend on the family farm. A wolf suddenly appears and begins viciously attacking both of the boys. Carl's friend manages to break free from the wolf and squirms under a fence to safety, but Carl is attacked and killed by the wolf who runs off with his body and stashes it in a ditch about a mile away. A hunting party was finally organized by the government and professional hunters were finally planning a hunt for the wolves. By November 19, they decided on a focused hunt commencing on December 10. A little after the new year, they successfully shot and killed a very large and old female wolf. Her teeth were worn down. Her coat was long and shaggy and had a faded yellow hue. Two weeks later, on January 14th, an old male wolf believed to be her mate was also killed by a local hunter. All wolf attacks had stopped as soon as the older female and male wolves were shot, but the hunt continued with a total of 12 wolves being either shot and killed or poisoned. Over the next several decades, wolf eradication was made a priority. By 1973, all wolves in the area were effectively extinct, minus some wolves being protected in captivity. Thankfully, the wolf population has grown back to just over 250. Along with the growing population of wild gray wolves, reported attacks on people have now begun to rise after decades of zero yearly attacks. There's now an average of one attack per year in the area, and it's only a matter of time before the next wolf attack leading to someone's unfortunate final affliction.